Well, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the April 22nd North Idaho College Board of Trustees meeting. Um, it's six o'clock. We've got uh, all five trustees online as well as uh, the college uh, attorney and the president. So we will go ahead and uh, get started. I'd like to remind everyone that uh, if you're not speaking, please go ahead and mute your mic so that we uh, won't hear a background or feedback uh, into the uh, sound uh, system. Uh, Brad, uh, I'd like to ask you to um, go ahead and uh, read the mission statement for us if you have that available to you. For Trustee Murray, I should say. You're, you're muted, Brad. Brad, you're muted. So I said, I'm having to go back through my email and get the board agenda up. So I'm gonna have to just defer for a second and ask someone else to do that while I find our agenda again. All right. Uh, right. Trustee Wood, do you have that available? Here. Okay, there we go. Okay, sure. North Idaho College meets the diverse educational needs of students, employees, and North Idaho communities it serves through a commitment to student success, educational excellence, and community engagement, and lifelong learning. Thank you, Trustee Wood. Uh, we will forego the Pledge of Allegiance uh, because we don't have a flag and also uh, we don't wish to see everybody in their pajama bottoms. The, uh, we have a quorum and next on the agenda is a review of the minutes. Are there any uh, changes, additions, or deletions to the minutes from our last meeting? Hearing none, they will uh, stand uh, as published. Shannon indicated that there is no public comment tonight. And so we will move to constituent reports because we don't have celebrating success in these Zoom meetings. And uh, in the last meeting, uh, constituents could provide a written report or uh, provide a report uh, orally. And so, uh, Paul, uh, you're on for ASNIC. Hello, everyone. Good evening, Chair Dunlap, members of the board, and President McClendon. Can you all hear me? All right, wonderful. Well, it's good to see you all again. While quarantined, our Constitution Committee that we formed has not been idle. They've been working very hard finishing our Constitution review, that which I've told you about. We have sent it out to all the students uh, earlier today for the changes to be voted on. Our hope is that our board meeting next week will formally approve those changes. Um, another thing that I want to mention is that the college has been actively seeking out ways to keep students in the loop with regular updates through several different mediums. Um, they have done a couple of live forums on the SNU grading system, and I believe they intend to do several more live forums on different topics. This Friday, the forum will be on student finances which will include topics such as financial aid. I myself attended uh, one of the forums a couple weeks ago and it was absolutely fantastic. And I think it's a great way to reach out to students and get that information about, um, just because everything is changing so quickly, there's a lot of confusion. Um, I think it's an effective way of uh, communicating. Well, unfortunately, with the lockdown, many senator projects have been temporarily put on hold. Regardless, we in the student government have been keeping busy promoting elections, meeting with accreditation teams, as well as working with communications and marketing on a retention video. And last week, as the student government held their elections for next year's student government representatives, we have the results in. We are happy to welcome back Mary and Angela, who have come back as senators. We also have some new faces, which will include Hannah Neff, Annie Vladovska, and Jameson Wasson. Justine has returned and has taken on the role of the vice president position. And of course, Kai Sotomayor-Nardi, our previous vice president, will now be taking over my position as the ASNIC president. 
And if I may, I would like to introduce you to her today. Um, Kai, are you out there? Yes, hello. Can everyone hear me? Hi. Um, it is really nice to be here, and I am excited to step into a new position. So, yeah, thank you. Well, that will be next year's uh, ASNIC president. So, you'll be seeing her a lot more uh, in the future. Thank you so much. That's been my report, and I'm happy to answer any questions now. Any questions or comments for Paul? I, I have one question. Um, on the forums that you had, Paul, were those conducted by Zoom? Were they live? How, how do you conduct those? Those uh, were actually done by the uh, student services. They're done over Zoom. Um, and it's actually, it's very effective. They have they basically everyone muted um, except for a few staff members who are answering questions. They have the chat open so that students can come in and ask questions in real time and get their, their questions answered. The um, ASNIC student body president, this gal, is going to be the one next year. That's correct. So this is what the NSC Board Foundation? The Foundation Board? I'm sorry? Paul, anything else? Nope, that's all. I, I thought I heard another voice there, but I, I wasn't sure if there was a question or not. Um, Kai, welcome. Uh, we're certainly glad to have you, and we look forward to working uh, with you. Uh, next, we have staff assembly with Tom Green. Good evening, Chair Dunlop and trustees. Everyone, everyone hear me all right? Okay. Thank you for the opportunity to address you today from my own living room, no less. Uh, we had a very well attended staff meeting, assembly meeting this month, 146 staff members tuned into Zoom, which blew the old staff assembly Zoom attendance record right out of the water. Uh, we first heard from the great Steve Kurtz, who of course has navigated the college through the accreditation process. When we had the staff meeting, Steve was in the throes of accreditation, so we appreciate him taking the time to answer questions and provide updates. The majority of the meeting consisted of President McClennan and PC members addressing staff and answering questions. It was a super opportunity for everyone to connect as well as we can these days. President McClennan shared his appreciation for the hard work that has gone into the preparation for the accreditation visit, as well as collectively working together to pull off the transition into remote learning and operations. We also heard from some other, some other success stories, such as the Student Relief Fund and the donation from several departments uh, around campus of uh, 1,895 masks to Kootenai Health. Overall, the meeting went very well, and I, I have to agree with President McClennan's assessment during the meeting that it feels good to have everyone moving away from a state of constant crisis management and back into a somewhat normal rhythm. Uh, there's one thing I'd like to address briefly. I know Faculty Assembly has a resolution concerning step increases and the budget that Chris Pelchat will be presenting tonight. While we are in support of, we are supportive of faculty assembly, staff assembly has not had an opportunity to discuss the issue as a whole, and we plan on discussing it at our next meeting. Um, unless there are any questions, that's my report. Questions for Tom? Joe, Mr. Chair? Yes, Trustee Wood. Uh, Tom, first of all, it's fantastic that the college stepped up, and I know there's a whole team of people that stepped up to make that donation happen for the personal protective equipment. Does anyone have any idea um, if they still have a need? Are they going to come back and, and hope for more? And, and if so, can we fulfill that for them? Just any, any kind of information on what their need would be. Uh, uh, Trustee Wood, I don't personally. Uh, I'm sure there's always a need. It seems that that's so. I, I would just go ahead and make the assumption that there is a need. I, I don't know if, if if every closet on campus has been checked yet. I know they were coming from very different places. I think I want to say the carpentry program was one of the largest ones that donated, which of course is who would have, who would have thought? But um, you know it. it so I don't know. I don't know. We can check into it, though, and we absolutely will. President McLennan, do you have a comment? 
uh, Chair Dunlop, I just, I believe we gave everything we had. And I think uh, the ones found in the carpentry, carpentry program were actually found by accident. I don't think uh, we were aware that we still had those in storage. So I, I think we're done with those, but we have, we have other things that we're still continuing to do um, around uh, some of our facilities and other, other ways to support um, the efforts that are underway. Anything else for Tom Green? If not, we'll be followed by faculty assembly, Chris Pelchat. Good evening, Chair Dunlap, uh, fellow board members, President McClendon, everyone else zoomed in here this evening. Uh, here's my report. Um, I first wanna start with a disclaimer that I am uh, reporting from my attic, trying to be as far away from my two new puppies um, as, as I can. So if you hear any barking or yipping, I, I apologize for that. Uh, I first want to congratulate the college on its accreditation results. Um, I've been involved with accreditation efforts uh, at several institutions and it's no easy feat for us to come out the way that we did last week, especially with the way the site visit had to be conducted. I think everyone should feel proud of the work uh, that was done to pull that off and, and the results. Uh, at our April faculty assembly meeting, we began with both the Senate report and the chair report, um, basic things covering just meetings that have been conducted uh, throughout the month. Um, and then we moved to new business. Uh, for me, it was the first time I've uh, facilitated a large scale Zoom uh, meeting with voting occurring. Um, so I learned a lot about Zoom polls and um, all of that fun stuff. Uh, the first point of order was related to campus marketing uh, communication efforts and the importance of focused efforts for the fall. Um, and this discussion resulted in a resolution that I'll read now. Because the coronavirus has left NIC students and potential students feeling uns unsure about their academic and economic futures, the Faculty Assembly of North Idaho College requests that the Communications and Marketing Department make the recruitment and retention of students for fall 2020 semester a top priority. We request that the communication and marketing efforts be expedient, adaptive, functional, and innovative in developing its strategies. We request that it engage with our academic and career technical divisions so that we can contribute to those efforts. Um, this resolution passed with unanimous support. And one thing I want to note is that the, the intent of the resolution was to be collegial. Um, we all work with that department. We know how much uh, work they have on their plate to market all the efforts that we have going on here at NIC and we just wanna make sure that the majority of those efforts are uh, focused on fall uh, as we all uh, know that we're all a little leery of what those um, enrollment numbers are gonna look like. The second point of order for the meeting was related to standing committees for fall 20 or academic year 2021. Um, this, this year we rewrote the policy and procedure on committee, committees, hoping to stack those committees prior to the beginning of the next school year. And we've so far been successful in doing that. Um, we got all the faculties, rep, all faculty representation necessary for each of the standing committees for next year in place. And those slates were voted on and approved at the last assembly meeting. Um, so folks that attend to chair those committees are gonna be pretty excited that they already have their leadership in, in place come August. Uh, next, we, we discussed the process for selecting new faculty leadership for the Senate and Assembly uh, positions. Um, nominations were made, and we have enough folks nominated to run an election in May for all seats that are open. Um, so we're pretty excited about that. We were then provided an update from Christy Mendoza about the efforts of the commencement committee. And we discussed creative solutions for involving the faculty in some sort of a virtual commencement experience. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about wanting to protect the integrity of the experience of students coming out of um, commencement and walking through the faculty tunnel and how can we recre recreate something like that. Um, so I think we came up with some creative solutions that are going to be pretty fun and, and make the event meaningful, um, but I'll leave those as a surprise. Uh, finally, we were uh, provided an update on the position paper drafted by the meet and confer committee. Uh, we discussed the budget options related to steps that were requested by the board for the meeting today. And these discussions resulted in a resolution that I will read now. Faculty assembly does not agree with any budget proposal that seeks to forego salary steps either in part or in, in whole. 
Faculty Assembly recognizes that the current state of conditions is just the situation that could warrant foregoing salary schedule steps. However, in this current time, it is the very employees at the heart of making this situation adaptable and functional that would be denied their salary schedule longevity step. Had previous administrations not been denying salary schedule steps for conditions that in no way warranted it, we could be more accepting of such a decision to forego salary schedule steps. Further, should a budget proposal be approved by the board that foregoes salary schedule steps for FY21, either in whole or in part, the assembly recommends that meet and confer amend their proposal to request a full commitment to retroactive inclusion of the foregone step in future budget cycles. Um, so as the chair, I wanna make sure that the board knows that this resolution was not taken lightly and was discussed from many points of view. While most were in agreement that the college's obligation to honor the earned step increase, there were folks in opposition of the timing of this particular resolution. While the motion to adopt the resolution did pass, it was not unanimous. It was also asked of me to remind the board and inform the public that in contrast to base salary increases, which are subject to annual budgetary constraints, earned vertical steps within salary schedules at North Idaho College represent a principal means of both recruiting and retaining a highly qualified workforce. After the discussion around the meet and confer proposal, uh, we ended with some remarks for the good of the order. And that concludes my report. Does the board have any questions? Thank you, Chris. Any questions for uh, Chris? Uh, Mr. Chair, it's Christy. Yes, Christy Wood. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, good report and uh, two interesting resolutions. I guess what I'd ask you to take back to, um, to your committee and group is that there's going to be a lot of very thoughtful discussions that take place around uh, the step in the budget. And um, I think we'll try to be as creative as possible and as respectful as possible. Um, appreciate the feedback. And, and hope that people understand we're going to do our best too. We just don't know yet. There's a lot of unknowns. So if you could take that back to the group, um, that's just my, my thoughts. Will do. Appreciate that. Other questions or comments for Chris? Chris, uh, one other thing. Could you uh, make sure those uh, resolutions get forwarded to uh, President McLennan so that they can then be forwarded on uh, to the board. You bet. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, next, the Senate. Is Ben Tushida out there? I didn't see him on the uh, list of participants, but Ben, are you there? All right. It appears Ben is not here with us this evening. And so uh, we'll move on to the president's report. Dr. Joe, McLennan? oh, sorry, um, Mr. Chair, Todd yes. Van Dijk. Yeah, Todd. Qu question for you real quick. Sorry, Rick, don't mean to cut you off. But we do have the meet and confer FY21 budget recommendation. Will that, when will that be actually specifically addressed? It's been spoken to and, and, and alluded to. Is somebody going to actually read that or present that at some point? Or would that be not until we actually get to, uh, to, to tab nine to talk about the budget. Trustee Banducci, was that a question for myself or for uh, Rick? I guess probably for President McLennan, you, you might not know. I don't know if Rick's the appropriate person to ask that to because the constituencies have, have spoken of it, but who's actually going to bring that up and, and present that or talk to it or when? Um, so I believe the trustees were sent some uh, additional documents for this evening's meeting, one of which included the most recent version of the uh, uh, recommendations coming or the... Um, and that's what I'm referring to, Rick. I'm looking yeah. at it right now. Uh, and that's provided as information for the board to, uh, I guess, support their discussion on the budget when we get to that item would be my thought. Okay. Thank you. All right, President's report. Sure. <clears throat> I will, uh, yes, let me go ahead. 
I'm going to start with uh, COVID-19. Uh, that's dominating everything, so I think it's only appropriate that it, uh, I, it begins my report. I want to start by uh, publicly, uh, again, just commending everybody at North Idaho College uh, for the uh, just everything that this college has done together uh, to respond to the current environment that we're in, and in especially in service to our students and in service to each other. It's truly been inspiring. And um, uh, yeah, I, nobody wants to be in this situation, but I can't think of a finer group of people to be in it with than the faculty and staff of North Idaho College. We uh, continue with our remote operations. Tomorrow, I'll, uh, I, I'm sorry, not tomorrow, but later this week, I will be sending out information to the college about the status of that remote work. Uh, uh, status <clears throat> and um, it's very likely that we will be continuing in this uh, manner through the remainder of this semester which now uh, as you know extends to May 21st. We're, we are uh, currently planning for summer and fall uh, but as everybody knows there's just so much uncertainty right now that uh, even the planning has elements of uncertainty into it and we're trying to accommodate and respond to those things. A couple things that we have done we uh, created two student, I would call them student-friendly academic policy responses to COVID-19. Uh, the withdrawal policy, which uh, extended the withdrawal date for students post spring break and as they entered into this virtual online uh, learning environment uh, and included with that extension, deadline extension, uh, are allowing students to, uh, who do withdraw during that time frame to use those uh, credits in the fall or the spring of next year. We also, uh, another res the second response is re related to a satisfactory and satisfactory grade policy. Um, and this is allowing students to, if it, if it fits their circumstances, to, to determine to apply to take a uh, S or SU grading option versus a letter option. And we're uh, allowing students to make that choice after they know their final status in the class. So we want to make sure that students have the best possible advantage of how they're going to be impacted, again, by this shifting environment that, that uh, they've been hurled into. Um, <clears throat> we are working, uh, did report earlier uh, in some of the earlier budget conversations about the CARES Act and how the college is responding to that. Uh, However, we've received uh, guidance yesterday that's going to be shifting our thinking uh, on that a little bit. If you recall, we, uh, North Idaho College will receive by formula uh, a little over $2 million, about $2.1 million in funding, federal funding through the CARES Act. 50% of that is um, required to go directly to students, who, uh, uh, obviously uh, those which is all of our students have been impacted by this pandemic. We're still receiving guidance on how those, how those, uh, some of the conditions and terms of those monies will be getting to students. The other 50% uh, uh, was announced uh, today. Uh, <clears throat> um, the release of that was announced today. And those funds are used are for the institution to enable them to allow uh, cost uh, recovery as a, as a result of COVID-19. One of the ways that we had intended to use a portion of the student uh, facing funds uh, was uh, to augment our student emergency fund. If you recall, ASNIC contributed uh, $10,000 to that student emergency fund and then the institution uh, put additional resources to that. Uh, to date, we've uh, helped 91 students uh, and have awarded just a little under $25,000. So, uh, and we're, we're getting more and more into that. Students are learning about it, and so we expect those numbers to go up considerably. Um, the other thing I guess I wanted to mention was uh, relative to COVID-19 is throughout this is we've been trying to keep the college together in terms of communication and, and, and having folks have knowledge about what's going on as decisions have been made. We've uh, administered two what we're calling pulse surveys. They're just really short surveys, check in, see how folks are doing. Um, uh, we uh, sent the last one out on, uh, I believe it was Monday, maybe of this week. Uh, anyway, 
Uh, the results of that survey, and I'll just, these are just the high points, 94% uh, of our faculty and staff uh, indicate that they're satisfied or very satisfied with COVID-19 related communications. Again, that, that percentage, 94%. We asked, uh, we asked about well-being, uh, their overall well-being during this, this uh, time. 76% indicated that they're doing well or thriving, uh, but of some concern is that 24% are feeling challenged. And so, uh, you know, we don't know exactly specifically who they are, but we know we need to, and we're working on some responses uh, to, that, um, to that information. And then we asked a question about their um, connection to coworkers, 81% indicated that they uh, were somewhat or very connected. And again, around that 20% 20 per, 20 range, 19% said they felt somewhat disconnected. So we know we have some development work to do there and we're going to be addressing that. Last question we asked and we received, uh, uh, there were about 183 uh, respondents to the survey. And uh, we asked the question, <clears throat> What can NIC do to improve your work experience during this time? And there were many, many comments supporting the efforts that are underway, uh, but we did receive some, as we'd expect, some ideas about how we can uh, even do some things better. So we'll be responding uh, to those uh, and following up on those. Uh, lastly, um, I want to just report non-COVID related. You've heard a couple comments about accreditation. We had our full scale visit last week and began on Monday. Um, thank you all for your participation in that. Uh, and uh, we had our exit two days of interviews and uh, meetings, uh, all virtual via Zoom. Uh, it was a pretty uh, intense schedule, a lot of participation throughout the college. I had the exit meeting with the uh, chair of the uh, committee uh, Friday morning at nine o'clock, and then she presented her. Uh, summary of findings uh, at a tenant meeting at 10 o'clock uh, to the college community, which we recorded and made available to, to everybody. And I just want to just briefly review for the full board uh, some of what we heard. <clears throat> um, first of all, we were thanked for uh, the work we did on the self-study and our hosting of this event in unusual times. Uh, we equally wanted to thank them because all of these evaluators are volunteers and they're dealing with the same issues in their institutions. Uh, that we're dealing with. Um, Dr. Sherwin began with commendations, and I just want to put this in a little context. It's not unusual for, for a team to balance out the commendations and the recommendations. Uh, commendations are great. Recommendations usually mean you have some work to do on, on some things. And so when she told me, she said, uh, uh, Dr. McLennan, I have five commendations my heart just started beating. I thought, oh no, we, ha we have five recommendations. Uh, but in fact, we have two recommendations. And the way she described the, the before she told me what those recommendations are, and I'll share them with you here briefly, but uh, she said, I want you to think of them as really as nudges uh, to help you on your way into the new standards and to be very successful with your mid-year, your mid-cycle uh, evaluation. So, um, the commendations went, uh, were for the library, especially around uh, the diversity, uh, the way we're serving uh, our region remotely, and the education aspects of our library. And I was you know, particularly pleased to see that. If you recall, there was a recommendation around the library uh, from the last full-scale evaluation, and it's a testament to uh, the college and to, that, uh, uh, to the library and library staff. Uh, George, uh, everybody involved to completely come to the other end of the continuum and just knock it out of the park. The second recommendation was for uh, the college's efforts around community engagement uh, and um, lots of examples around that. Uh, specifically mentioned uh, the, the, the uh, profound way that we're, we're addressing and meeting the region's workforce uh, development needs and uh, recognition of the College Foundation as a significant partner in, in community engagement and supporting the college. The third commendation was uh, uh, our, on our efforts to increase student success. And when you think about what we've been trying to do over the last several years um, to improve retention and enrollment overall, not, you know, 
enrollment's been declining, but um, on the retention side and really trying to serve students and support them more effectively. Uh, she mentioned uh, in her comments, Cardinal Learning Commons, the work that we've been doing on advising, certainly uh, Cardinal Central and the, and the consolidation of student services to be there where students need them to be all in one place, and uh, the significant work that we've done on our remedial pathway work. So uh, it's kind of nice to see the things recognized that we've really been working on. The fourth commendation was on stewardship of resources. Uh, and especially around the planning that the college has done for sustainability. And, you know, in the current, in the current environment, uh, you know, if you think about the way we began the year with the three-year plan for looking at our, the structural aspects of our budget, and then uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, experience that we're having right now, and uh, the some of the challenges that other colleges are facing, we're all gonna be facing them, but we're, I think we're in a little better position to be facing them. Um, I think that commendation was very well deserved. And the last commendation was for our workforce training center uh, and uh, the efforts that we have to meet the workforce training needs of the region, continuing education, and in particular, the, uh, the work that that unit has done to improve uh, through assessment and through uh, program review. It was uh, very obvious that uh, it's had a big impact on that overall operation. So those are the commendations. Recommendations, again, as I mentioned, she, she postured them as nudges, uh, but they are things that we'll need to respond to. The first one is related to our institutional goals and objectives, and that's coming out of the planning work, but it's not the planning work itself. It's it, the recommendation, and I don't have the specific wording, is around the metrics and the measures that we are that we need to continue to develop uh, to line up to the new standards so that we're able to demonstrate mission fulfillment uh, of, those goals, of those goals and objectives. So again, it's one of those, um, you're on the road to doing it, uh, and this recommendation is gonna nudge us to continue doing it, but I've specifically appreciated her reference to the new standards. Do you recall, we're shifting out of uh, the standards of 2010, and now as we go into our next full-scale evaluation, uh, we have these new standards that are very sp specific about uh, indicating, uh, about demonstrating student success and having measures and measurements to support that work. So uh, some good guidance there. And then the second recommendation was to engage in an effective learning outcomes assessment. Again, that's uh, uh, pointing us towards the new standards. It's one that uh, if you board recalls, you'll recall that we had a uh, celebrating success about starting student about learning outcomes assessment, uh, I believe two board meetings ago, maybe three board meetings ago. And the good work that you saw there uh, is recognized by the evaluation committee, but, in, but we, know, we knew then that it's incomplete and we have more work to do there. So those are the two recommendations. Uh, overall, um, yeah, I think the college did a terrific job um, positioning itself, uh, conducting the self-evaluation. It was an honest self-study. Uh, and it, it spoke to our strengths and it really gave North Idaho College a chance to shine uh, throughout this process. So again, my appreciation for everybody involved in that and, and thank you to the board uh, for your support and your involvement in the process as well. That concludes my report. Questions or comments for President McLennan? Trustee Howard. Your, your mic's not on. Uh, input from what's going to happen uh, now. Um, is there going to be a written report? Will it be publicly disseminated? Thank you, uh, Trustee Howard Chair Dunlap. Uh, I had that right in my notes and I just didn't talk about it. So what will happen is I will get a confidential report. The college will receive a confidential report uh, usually a few weeks after the visit. So I would expect by next Friday that I would have that confidential uh, report. <clears throat> I have a period of time to check it for factual uh, errors, um, not certainly content or evaluation errors, um, even though I may think there may be some, I can't correct those. Uh, but uh, the factual ones, we'll get those back uh, to the chair. Um, then the chair will send that report to the full commission. Uh, 
the evaluation team uh, does not make uh, recommendations uh, or determinations of accreditation status or even what's going to happen with these recommendations. That's, that's the work of the, of the commission itself. We will then uh, participate in a June, uh, mid to, to late June uh, commission meeting where uh, I and others uh, from the college will be invited to go before the commission uh, to learn the outcome of this uh, full-scale evaluation visit. Um, so I guess to your first question, it's not a publicly released document, the, the report that, uh, that we received uh, from the commission. Other questions or comments? Yes, I have one, one more. Um, President McLennan, you indicate that the, you get the um, initial report, a confirmational report. It's a thing, almost in a draft, it sounds like. And then um, you have an opportunity to make some corrections. But ultimately, when you get before the commission, and um, do they issue some kind of a final report? But, so the, w when I send the report back to the chair, uh, Dr. Sherwin, she will finalize her report. It will become her of her evaluation team's official report. That report will go to the commission. The commission will assign some number of commissioners to review that report. Uh, and whatever interaction needs to go back and forth between the commissioners and Dr. Sherwin, um, then they will make a determination and there will be a finding, uh, an outcome that will be uh, and those outcomes are well defined in the accreditation process: renewal, you know, status renewal, um, you know, warning, uh, and other other actions the commission can take. I don't. I, I this is as positive an outcome of an accreditation visit as that I've ever uh, had the uh, uh, opportunity to participate in. So at this point, I don't foresee any adverse. Um, Acti actions or activities coming out of this, but we will re receive a final determination of our status. Mr. Chair. Trustee Howard. Um, President McClellan, the reason I asked is, um, it sounds like this is a very good report and uh, reflects the, the tremendous effort that uh, you and the members of the college community have put together to get to this point and it would be nice if something something is public that we could get out at some point in time that reflects the positive aspects of this and i guess that's where my questions were heading not so much to the negative end of it but to the positive end of it so that we might have something um that we that will show the efforts that you put into it thank you there's i appreciate that trustee howard and there's um, absolutely nothing to prevent us from screaming to the hills how how we feel we did with how we actually did and demonstrating that we're we're not bound by any confidentiality in, in this process at all. Any other questions or comments for yeah. President McLennan? Sure, Dunlap. Just wanted to Trust express to just wanted to express my appreciation uh, to President McLennan, but. Uh, in particular, uh, all of those folks on campus that uh, participated in, in everything that they do anyway, but accreditations are always uh, kind of a stressful time, never knowing what uh, the committee, visiting committee is going to come out of there uh, with. So to have such a good uh, review is uh, kudos to everyone there on NIC campus. Mr. Chair. Right. Yes, Trustee Wood. Thank you. I'll just, I absolutely agree with what Brad said. And I just wanted to add that um, the team made it so um, easy for the board with the workshops and uh, the information that was provided to help us with our visit with the accreditors. And so I wanted to thank everyone for that and commend them for a great job done. All right. Thank you. Anything else for President McLennan? Trustee Banducci, do you have any updates uh, with regard to KTEC? Uh, yes, I do. We actually had a uh, virtual Zoom meeting today and an executive session. Um, we uh, have just completed the evaluation of the director of Colby and uh, the unanimous decision of the board to retain his services. He's doing an outstanding job out there. 
Um, he gave us a little bit of an enrollment update today. Um, at this time last year, they had 405 applications. Uh, to date this year, they have 475. So it's uh, up over 14% uh, this year. They already have wait lists for the automotive, diesel, and welding programs. And even with the addition of the third healthcare instructor, they are approaching uh, capacity for that program as well. There's uh, been some goings on at the division of uh, CTE, and there were some challenges with some funding, and um, they've found some of it back, I guess, if you will, and so KTEC's going to get a little bit of money back from that, and they're being held under the hold harmless, so a little bit of funds coming back from that, which was good news. And the division itself is restructuring, and they've actually eliminated uh, one of the deputy director positions, so they're working down there on their budget to try to do some things. So I think everything's everything's uh, out in the open right now to try to figure out how everybody proceeds from where we're at uh, with the current circumstances. But overall, K Tech is uh, is doing extremely well. Um, and I shared with them a little bit about NIC and how we're doing. I mentioned the accreditation team and, and that we had the opportunity to speak to our partnership with uh, with K Tech. And uh, like us. Uh, they're trying to work on a budget too, and there's a lot of unknowns. So um, I think that's about it, unless there's any questions. Sure, Ben, Matt. Yes, uh, go ahead, Trustee Murray. Uh, Trustee Banducci, thank you again for the report. Uh, you're a good fit out there, and you, you do well reporting what's going on. My question is about uh, kind of what Chris uh, Pelchat was talking about. In terms of marketing, and again, uh, you know, with our close proximity to uh, K Tech and now our working relationships, have they talked very much about uh, the recruitment of those kids just to walk over and get in that those programs that coincide? You know, Brad, your your question is timely because again, we we have just completed the evaluation of the director and and talked about some things. And, and um, one of the things that's being encouraged, I think, by the leadership out there is to try to toot the horn a little bit more of KTEC and to be a little more outgoing and proactive and, and more reach out. And, you know, and someone even used the term kind of celebrating their success. And that gave me the opportunity to, to share how we do celebrating success, you know, and it's at the board meeting, it's, it's you know, you can go online and see it, uh, you know, at our website, you know, it's, over it's played over on the tv channels during the course of the month and that's just one way that every month we try to highlight some of the good things that are being done at the college and, and promoting it and and shining a light on those folks that are doing a great job and so i, I shared that with them a little bit and I, it doesn't really quite translate to what they've got out there but the concept is just again tooting the horn and trying to to point out those areas of success and and to do the things that might attract people you know a way to, to again toot our horn and, and advertise kind of like you know NIC trying to highlight those things also to you know entice people to want to come be a part of the team part of the program here so I think that's being worked I think uh, the staff at KTEC is going to be encouraged to try to find more opportunities to do that and uh, and, to tr and to try to get out there more and promote it and more about our partnerships you know so it's you know beyond just the HVAC and the collision repair and you know walking across the parking lot. So uh, to your point, I think that's a, a point of emphasis that's going to be looked at more going forward. Thank you, Trustee Banducci. Thank you very much for the report. Uh, under old business, we have uh, three uh, second readings of revised policies relating to uh, HR. And Karen Hubbard is going to walk us through that. So Karen, the floor is yours. Good evening, uh, Chair Dunlop and trustees. Um, I'm presenting tonight the three policies um, for the second reading, beginning with uh, policy 3.01 on employee classifications. And I'll be happy to take any questions you may have um, before you consider it.
Mr. Chair. If yes, there's Chair. no if there's no questions, I'd like to uh, advance a motion. Oh, go ahead. Uh, yes, I'd like uh, to to move that the board approve the revisions to the employee classifications policy 3.01. Is there a second to that? Mr. Chair, I'll second that. Seconded by Trustee Wood. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Uh, tab two, the second reading of revised policy 3.0203. Karen? Um, once again, um, this is the policy that we brought up for the first reading last, last month. Um, and I would stand for any questions you may have on policy 3.02.03, filling of new and vacant positions. Again, Mr. President, if there are no further questions, I'd like to advance a motion. Is there a second to the motion? Brad will second that one. Trustee Murray seconded the, the motion. Any further discussion relating to uh, policy 3.0203? Yes, Mr. Chair, it's Christy. Uh, yes, Trustee Wood. I would just like to um, thank Karen and uh, uh, Dr. McLennan and Chris Martin. We had a good discussion around this policy and some great clarification. I understand that um, this policy doesn't supersede existing policy and I, I have no issues with it. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion to approve Policy 3.0203, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, the motion uh, to approve policy 3.0203 uh, carries. Next, uh, the second reading of policy 3.0233. Uh, Karen, you're up one more time. Uh, this is the third policy that uh, we brought up for first reading last month. This is the second reading. And again, I would stand for any questions on policy 3.02.33 on reclassifications. Any questions or comments? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion. To Trustee Wood, go ahead. Uh, approve policy 3.02.33. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Brad, Brad will go ahead and second that. It was a, <laughs> Shannon, I'm not sure who seconded that. Uh, it was Brad. either Ken or Brad. Brad, okay. Uh, any further discussion relating to policy 3.02.033? Hearing none, all in favor of uh, approving the motion to adopt policy 3.02.33, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The policy uh, is approved as presented. Thank you very much, Karen, appreciate that. Thank you all. Next, we have Dr. Lita Burns uh, under new business regarding the awarding of tenure. Get myself unmuted here. Chair Dunlap, members of the board, Dr. McLennan, Mr. Lyons, colleagues and guests. It is an honor to present to you the candidates for consideration of tenure. As you know, tenure is a highly respected and valued academic appointment at North Idaho College that is not assigned or given but rather earned. Faculty hired into tenure track positions spend a minimum of three years engaged in scholarship, service, and most importantly, improving and honing their teaching effectiveness. The faculty are evaluated by students in every course they teach during every semester of the three probationary years. And they are evaluated once a semester by their uh, faculty evaluation team and their division chair. The faculty also write a self-evaluation describing their progress. 
At the end of the first and second year of the process, the faculty receive verbal and written feedback on their progress. The feedback includes constructive critique in the areas needing improvement and positive reinforcement in the areas they have demonstrated successes. At the end of the third year, the faculty receive a summative evaluation for the probationary period. This summative evaluation serves as the basis for the recommendation by the faculty evaluation team and the division chair, which is made, at the, made in the fall of the fourth year. The faculty pre prepare a portfolio to present to the tenure committee, to me, to the president, and to you, the board of trustees. The portfolios, as you have seen, are, massive, are a massive collection of evaluations that they have received and provide evidence that the faculty have met all the criteria established in policy to be recommended for tenure. I am proud to present to you the faculty who have been recommended for tenure for 2020. I asked each candidate to introduce themselves after I announced their name. I am hoping the highlight on the Zoom picture frame that we have allows you to quickly identify our tenure candidates. So I'm going to go slow as I announce their names so they can introduce themselves. Ms. Blanchette. So this is Kirsten Blanchette. I teach chemistry for natural sciences. Thank you, Kirsten. Ms. Hallett. Hello, can you see Hallett? Um, I teach physics and astronomy for the natural sciences. Thank you, Casey. Dr. Joseph? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan, and I teach chemistry also in the natural sciences division. Big year for natural sciences this year. Mr. Leonard? My name is Brandon Leonard. I teach mathematics for the mathematics, computer science, and, in and engineering division. And I want to just mention that Brandon is our Sandpoint-based full-time faculty. That's, that's a distinction. Um, Dr. Valente. Hi, I'm Faith Valente and I teach in the communication department in the communication and fine arts division. Thank you all for introducing yourselves and for being here this evening. I have recommended to the president, I have recommended to President McLennan and present to you the following candidates requesting your consideration for conferral of tenure. Dr. Burns, uh, I have a question. Uh, in the uh, board packet, it indicates that there are five candidates. Oh, I missed one. I'm so sorry. Oh my goodness. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> but, but you show six here. <laughs> I'm so, sorry, Joe, I didn't introduce Joe. I'm so sorry I missed you, Joe. Joe, would you please introduce yourself? No problem, thank you, Lita. Uh, my name is Joe O'Conn. I'm an instructor in the machining program, uh, second year instructor uh, in the trades and industry division. Thank you so much, Joe. That's what happens when you go off script. I was trying to do this just by memory. And I'm so sorry, my memory doesn't serve me. I really, truly apologize to you, Joe. Now, would you please accept these candidates for recommendation of tenure? Thank you, Dr. Burns. Is there a motion to approve tenure for the six candidates? Yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you, this is Christy. Yes, Trustee Wood. Uh, before I make a motion, I just want to say um, how sorry I am we can't have a big celebration. We really like to do a celebration. We're so proud of all of you, and I wish we could. Um, but but I, I hope you could be as happy as we are for all of you. So with that, I'll make a motion. I recommend that the Board of Trustees consider a motion to approve uh, tenure beginning fall 2020 for the faculty members presented. Is there a second to that motion? Second it, Ken Howard. The motion has been uh, seconded to approve the six candidates for tenure. Is there any discussion? Mr. Chair? Uh, yes, Trustee Howard. It's not so much a discussion as uh, I'll echo what um, 
Christy just said in the past, we've been able to celebrate this in person and go out and uh, mingle for a few minutes and give our personal congratulations to the candidates who achieved ten tenure. And um, I'd like to do that remotely here, but also invite everybody to go out and treat yourself to an appropriate drink when we're done uh, to make sure that the celebration carries on. All in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing no opposition, the motion passes and tenure will be awarded to those six candidates. And I would also like to add my congratulations for those faculty members for this well-deserved and well-earned uh, recognition. So we're glad that you have joined the Academy as a tenured instructor. Can we, can we just do a virtual clap for them, virtual applause for them? <laughs> Thank you. I guess I need to turn on my mic, sorry about that. Uh, next we have uh, for action and approval, the Head Start supplemental application for COLA and Q1 quarter uh, one funding with Beth Ann Fuller. Uh, Chair Dunlap, members of the board and President McLennan, thank you for allowing me to bring forward the approval of tab number five for approval of our cost of living adjustment and our quality improvement application for ongoing funding, which totals $137,196 of ongoing funding for our program. And that would be uh, our cost of living adjustment will be a 2% to the wage and fringe and an increase in our maintenance supplies budget and our, our criminal background check budget and our quality improvement would include an increase in mental health consulting and an increase in classroom assistance and aids in our classrooms to help with um, quality of care and continuity of care in our classrooms. And that would be those two pieces for tab five. Questions or comments for Beth Ann Fuller? Mr. Chair? Uh, yes, Trustee Howard. If there are no questions, then I would like to move that the board um, approve the uh, cost of living, excuse me, approve the uh, cost of living adjustments and quality improvement funds that are reflected in attachments A, B, and C to the board materials. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second that. It's been uh, seconded by Trustee Wood. Any further discussion? Hearing none, uh, all in favor of approval of the Head Start supplemental application for COLA and Quality One funding, signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carries. Next we have uh, action and approval of Head Start application for COVID-19 supplemental funding, also with uh, Beth Ann Fuller. And Chair Dunlap and members of the board and President McLennan, thank you for allowing me to bring this forward as well, which is our application for um, some of the CARES Act funding that was awarded to Head Start. So the CARES Act funding of 500 million was awarded for programs to put in an application to do summer funding. So ours includes a um, proposal that we would put forward to the Office of Head Start to do an eight week summer program for four year olds that are going to kindergarten in September and three year olds who have individual education plans. And also the 250 million that was awarded to Head Start was specifically for COVID-19 funding to uh, 
to alleviate expenses related to COVID-19 that the program would incur. And that actual funding amount, which is non-competitive, has not come out yet. And what we're asking is to be able to accept it. It will come out in the same fashion as the cost of living adjustment and the quality improvement in a formula to our program to, to um, either retroactively go back and, and um, codes expenses that we've already incurred to the COVID-19 money being offered and or uh, future COVID-19 expenses throughout the rest of our program year that ends June 30th. Questions or comments for Beth Ann Fuller? Mr. Chair. Yes, Trustee Wood. I'll make a motion. Uh, before I do, I just want to say that Beth Ann wins the background award in Zoom for her zebra art. <laughs> Very cool. That's my, uh, my office. <laughs> Thank you. I'll make a motion to allow North Idaho College Head Start to submit an application for supplemental funds to provide one-time activities in response to COVID-19. Is there a second to that motion? Brad with second. The motion was moved and seconded uh, by Brad Murray. Any further discussion? Chair. Yes, Trustee Howard. Um, Beth Ann, th this, um, at least the way the description reads, is a little unusual to me. You're making an application for programs, but you don't know how much it's going to cost yet and how much you're going to get for it. Do I have that right? Um, yes, partially. So the summer funding, we do have a budget for. So that is actually rolling funding where... Um, as soon as we get our approval, we'll start to build this grant and put in the application for the 300 and it's three, sorry, I can't see in here, $363,543 for summer funding. They may come back and negotiate and say there's not that much or there that's not enough or um, an example might be eight weeks might be too long. They may say, okay, it would be safer to come back for only six weeks. They want us to put in the full amount of funding for our eight weeks, and then they will let us know whether enough funding is available to do the full eight weeks. Should there not be enough safety in our particular community to do the summer program, then the funding would, ju would just go back. Um, the other piece of the funding, the COVID-19 relief funding, they have not um, chosen the exact like formula yet. They just gave us the, what they call the um, uh, additional guidance today to what we can actually charge to the COVID-19 uh, funding. What I'm looking at is COLA was 196 million across the United States. This COVID-19 relief was 250 million. So when I look at our COLA amount that was given to us of the 62,716, I'm assuming that the amount of money that will be given to us based on how many children we serve will be around 65,000. We don't have that exact amount yet. Mr. Chair. Yes, Trustee Alec. Um, thank you for the explanation. Um, Beth Ann, I guess I'm still confused though. Are the, the, the COVID-19 funds are, don't involve a specific program, I, I would guess. They're just funds to reimburse for losses, but the um, <clears throat> supplemental funds are actually involve additional programming. So that we, are, are we gonna be in a position where we're getting involved in programming before we know it's gonna be paid for? Um, and if, it, if it's not gonna get paid for by the, by the through some kind of a grant, is uh, NIC going to have to come up with some money to, uh, to make sure that the program is adequately funded? Um, great question. So this is all the approvals and the grants are actually all due on May 15th. They hope to turn the, the approvals around by the following week. So we would not be starting any services or planning for any summer services until we hear how much funding we will actually receive. And with the COVID-19, 
It can I, either be reimbursable expenses so we can go back for an example and um, charge the one week that we bought food and had to close and didn't have any children to feed. Um, and that is not allowable to CACFP, but we can go back and ask for reimbursement of that. We can also go back and ask for other reimbursements and also do some additional uh, ex expenditures based on needing to keep staff busy and active and continuing to receive wages and benefits, but doing some um, important things for the program. So we, we will get some, those funding announcements will come out really quickly, a lot quicker than they usually do. Any other uh, comments from Beth Ann? Hearing none, uh, all in favor of the motion, uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone in opposition, same sign? Hearing none, the motion uh, carries to approve Head Start application for COVID-19 supplemental uh, funding. Thank you, Beth Ann. Thank you. Uh, next, we have the first reading of a board member uh, policy, and it's a policy relating to board member conduct, which is brought forward by Ken Howard. And I would ask Shannon that as uh, comments are presented that uh, you include those in a revision for us uh, for next uh, month's meeting. We'll do. Trustee, ha Trustee Howard. Yes. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, this proposal is one um, that actually I advanced for comment. Uh, it's a first reading, but. What I would suggest is that I have not heard of anything specific from different board members, but I would invite and would hope that each of the members of the board would review it and submit some written uh, changes, deletions, comments to whatever they find that they want to comment on in the policy so that we can revise it and um, present it again uh, it, it may get rev revised to the point where it will need another uh, first reading, but it, this is a, kind of a work in progress, and I, and I really would like to see the, each of the board members comment on it in writing so that I can use those written comments to, um, uh, to make sure that the policy sort of reflects as much as we can of agreement of the board. So the, uh, any comments that need to be made should be forwarded uh, to Shannon and uh, to Ken Howard uh, so they can coordinate uh, the revision. Uh, but notwithstanding any written comments that you may have forthcoming, uh, are there any uh, oral arguments or comments you'd like to make this evening uh, for any of the trustees? Mr. Chair, it's Christy. Uh, yes, Trustee Wood. Um, I appreciate that, uh, that Mr. Our Trustee Howard put this together and it's going to give us a lot of opportunity to provide input. I did go through it, um, have quite a bit of input, so I will um, put it in writing, get that back to him. I think it's good framework, but there, there's going to be some things that we will all just have to discuss and see if we can come to agreement on. But I, I think it's a, a great in progress. Any other trustee comments? Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, uh, is that Trustee Howard? Yes. Um, the, I would appreciate it to the extent that there are comments and that they'd be in writing uh, so that I can try and put them at the proper place in the policy, but the, also that the comments, if you can do it within the next couple of weeks so that I can put together another composite policy given the comments so that everybody gets a chance to look at it again before the next meeting. Um, so rather than wait until the last minute to do it, uh, try and do it in the next couple of weeks if you can. Okay, other comments? All right, thank you, Tr Trustee Howard. Um, so we'll get comments into you and to Shannon in the next 
a couple of weeks so that uh, you can consolidate those and coordinate uh, another draft with- Joe? Yes. Joe, can uh, you hear me? This is Todd. Yes, Trustee Banducci. Oh, sorry, I had a couple comments. I didn't seem to be getting through. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna take a little bit of a different tack. I, um, I've i also redlined the, the policy, but I'm gonna kind of talk to it from a 10,000 foot view. When I got it, and and I have I have responded a little bit as you guys are aware, but I, I took it and took it to a broader audience and and you know looked at some state and local elected officials on it, some attorneys, and and a few very smart people. And to be truthful, the the concept was kind of universally panned. It, uh, my opinion is. It should be scrapped in entirely. I, I think it's a bad start. I mean, I heard comments from elected officials where, and, and some things I, I won't share, but some of the comments and some of the phrases were not very flattering. And it was interesting because even from a couple different quarters, I came back to smacking about what Sandy Bloom tried to do to Dan Gookin. And then I ended up talking with Dan too about how when they wanted him to sign what was essentially a, a loyalty and conduct oath uh, back in the day. And, um, and it's kind of interesting because as a trustee, we don't give up our First Amendment rights when we become a trustee. And I, and I don't think a lot of this would pass the First Amendment test. As I said earlier, I think it's pretty vague in some areas. It's not well defined. I think it'd be unenforceable. And, and again, as I mentioned, as I've said, there's no actual grand authority under which to enforce it in the first place. You, you've got some issues there, and it's, it's really up to the taxpayers. And no one can remove a, a trustee. I mean, it could be a you were elected. So, I mean, it could be a recall election or, or at the time of re-election, you know, um, th that's how a, an elected official or appointed official is removed. But this thing will be preventing us, I think, from doing our duties and to effectively represent our constituents who've elected us. It will deprive us of the services and the ability to perform it. You know, I mean, even simple things, you know, I'll, I'll throw it, Ken, if you look at this literally in the, in the, in the wording, you could even say that something like you trying to have a, a, a weekly breakfast with Al would have been beyond the scope of this and, and, and out of bounds. Or, you know, as just one example, there, there are other things. So it's, it's a bit concerning as to what conversations or, or, or what activities would be, would be, you know, prohibited or, or potentially, you know, restricted. It's, it's, we're accountable to the public and, and they're the ones that vote for us. And, and the other thing is, I think the Idaho AG needs to look at this to make sure it's not in potential conflict with any of our Idaho statutes that, that govern us as elected officials. Secondly, we do have a, a, a policy 2.01.04. And yes, it does say that there are a number of organizations or groups within the, the college community that can initiate a policy, uh, you know, trustees, president, college senate, constituent groups, but it also lays out the framework that if you're going to propose a policy, it needs to run through all those constituent groups. And all the constituent groups should have ability to have an input on those policies. And I don't believe any other constituent group has seen this policy other than just trustees. And, and normally the policies are, der are derived and written by the college on our behalf if we have something that we want. It's unusual for us to actually originate a, a policy. Uh, usually it's, it's in response to a need. But at the, at the end of the day, there's some questions that then start to beg, you know, as you look at the language, you say, well, okay, when is criticism warranted? Or if we're loyal to the interest of NIC, is, is that saying that we put NIC ahead of the taxpayer? And then as you look at other language, it goes, okay, what is the standard for appropriate behavior, especially when we're dealing with sensitive issues? You know, and then something as simple as if a policy violates the fundamental civil rights, can it be ignored with impunity? Or, or even more importantly, if the board takes action against a duly elected trustee in violation of their civil rights, is the board liable for such action or can individual board members be found civilly or criminally liable? I mean, there's a whole lot of things that can come from this, unintended consequences as you, as you start to try to codify this and, and, and hold elected officials, you know, it's one thing to be accountable, but if you look even to state ethics laws, because we're not compensated, we technically don't even fall under them. The minimum threshold under those laws is $50 in compensation. 
That's why even the, the uh, highway districts are compensated. So we're kind of in a funny spot because we're not even compensated, so we fall below the $50 threshold uh, for the application of the ethics laws. So we're in an interesting place, and I think trying to, trying to bound us by a, an, an artificial document, very dangerous and, and truthfully inappropriate and unenforceable. So, I mean, my recommendation is that we don't try to go down this path because I think it's a mistake and I think we're setting ourselves up. Um, so, you know, to redline it, that's one thing, but I think it's a bigger picture than that. I think we've gotten to put ourselves in a spot that we need to be kind of careful about this. You know, so if I'm briefing today at KTEC, am I out of bounds because the, the trustees didn't all approve what I said at KTEC to share about the college? You know, again, having breakfast with a, with the athletic director as a trustee, is, is that out of bounds? It's, uh, it gets kind of interesting as to what is a conflict of interest and and with the definitions in there of, of communications and, and interpersonal um, interactions, well, you, I don't know if you can define every single, you know, possibility there. So I just think we're making a mistake to do this to ourselves. Any additional comments? Mr. Chair. Yes, Trustee Howard. Todd, I appreciate your comments. And, um, and I think I understand some of the criticisms and comments that you made. But I still think that um, it's important that we lay out at least some uh, concepts uh, of what's expected of us as trustees. And, and um, I can tell you as a lawyer, um, I don't know of a statute that's been written or regulations been written that doesn't have uh, questions that arise about it, and hence litigation takes place. So we're not going to we're not going to avoid all all conflicts and all differences of opinion. Hopefully, if if we can do this in a constructive way, we'll lay out fundamental concepts uh, that's expected of trustees, um, and um, some of the ones that are that are in the um, um, the proposed. Um, policy uh, concerns things such as conflicts of interest and um, uh, communications um, and how we go about that. Not not what we say, but how we go about it so that everybody has some kind of a roadmap as to what's an appropriate way to communicate with members of the staff and faculty. And right now there isn't anything to help us guide it. And I'm looking for future um, future situations to help other trustees that come on board with uh, some kind of a roadmap of, of how we go about things uh, uh, and our communications and our actions as trustees. So I'm hopeful that we can make this a constructive effort and I would appreciate written comments from you um, with regard to um, ways that we can do that. Any other comments uh, related to the proposed policy? Hearing none, um, again, I would reiterate, get your comments uh, into uh, Trustee Howard and Shannon. I think Trustee Banducci raises some uh, good questions that uh, may need to be answered. And it, it may very well be that uh, we will need uh, quite a bit additional time to hash through this. And we may look at uh, a workshop at some point to uh, try and answer those questions, have a further discussion, uh, and then determine uh, where we actually want to go. But this needed to be put on the agenda to spark that uh, discussion. So uh, thank you very much. Get your comments in, and uh, then we'll take a look at what the next steps are. All right, uh, Chris Martin, you're up with uh, approval for the postponement of the Meyer Health Science building expansion. Uh, Chair Dunlap, members of the board, thank you for the opportunity to bring this before you this evening. We discussed this at the board workshop uh, on the budget last month and the college actually bought, brought forward formal authorization to the board and so in keeping with that we wanted to bring this back uh, formally to the board requesting authorization for us to pause this project or postpone it um, due to COVID-19. 
do I hear a motion in support of postponing uh, the Meyer Health Science expansion? Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, Trustee Howard. Yes, uh, just in aid of a, at least the motion, is the proposal that we uh, pause it uh, indefinitely and you're gonna, the, the administration will come back to the board to remove the pause or is that something that's gonna be left to the discretion of the administration in, in your, I mean, I need to know how to make the motion if we're gonna make it. Uh, Chair Dunlap, Trustee Howard, our intent is to come back to the board um, in the fall of next year. So this would be a pause and we would come back for authorization. Mr. Chair. Trustee Howard. Yes, uh, with that, I'd like to make a motion that the board authorize the administration to pause the um, uh, and postpone the uh, development of the Meyer Health and Science Building expansion until the administration comes back to the board for approval to, to continue the project. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second that. Trustee Wood seconds the motion. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Hearing none, the motion uh, carries to postpone the uh, proposed expansion of Meyer Health Science until such time uh, the administration comes back to the board to move forward with that particular uh, project. The uh, next item under new business is the first reading of the FY21 general fund budget. And I'd like to uh, make some comments before uh, Chris uh, jumps in there. Uh, we had some individual budget meetings with uh, President McClendon, uh, Vice President Martin and uh, Sarah Garcia. And during the meeting, I asked the question, uh, do we need to approve the full budget at the May meeting? Because our fellow community colleges do not uh, approve their budgets until July. And uh, uh, Vice President Martin indicated that at the May meeting, which is when we normally approve a budget, really the only thing that needed to be approved uh, was tuition and fees. And so I would ask trustees as we move into our May meeting to consider uh, that we approve the tuition and fees at that meeting. And because of the unknowns with regard uh, to budget, to reimbursements, to enrollment, uh, and what is happening uh, with the COVID-19, that uh, we, we may consider uh, approving the final budget uh, in the uh, June or even the July meeting. So I wanna make that editorial comment for you to consider. And then uh, Vice President Martin, uh, please go ahead with your uh, proposed budget. Uh, Chair Dunlop, members of the board, thank you very much again for this opportunity to come before you with a proposal for the FY21 budget. Um, as Chair Dunlap mentioned, this is a very uncertain time, and so that uncertainty is baked into some of the, the assumptions that we're going to present this evening and would, would just open this up for questions and dialogue and discussion with the board as we move through this. Uh, my intent is to walk through the, the board budget book um, and hit some, some high-level points and then um, provide time for discussion or, or seek the board's direction on how deep you want to go on some of these items. So for the, the revenue picture for the college um, for next, next fiscal year, um, there are some substantial changes to revenue based off of um, our current FY20 budget. One of those is truing up um, the FY20 budget to, to actuals. Um, that's, that's substantial, as well as looking at um, forecasting a 9% decline in enrollment for next fiscal year. And so what we had talked about last month um, at the board budget meeting was, was really pre-COVID-19 uh, pre and some of the things that were occurring so quickly a month ago. And so we had originally forecasted a 3% decline in enrollment for the upcoming fiscal year. We've adjusted that assumption to, to 9%. 
Um, in, in complete transparency, I feel like our team usually does a very good job and has a, a good feel for what we're going to be looking at in enrollment. That is not the case this year. Um, frankly, we're, we don't have a trend to go off of. We don't have a prior experience that would tell us exactly how to plan for, for a pandemic and the impact that it would have on enrollment. And so this is, this is a educated guess, but it is not um, forecasted the way that we typically forecast our enrollment. So there's a lot of ambiguity in this number. So I wanna own, own that up front, that 9% decline in enrollment. So year over year, really what we're looking at uh, for next fiscal year, we have not proposed a tuition in, or fee increase. We have not proposed a tax increase in this proposal. And so what's driving the change in, in revenue year over year forecasting at this point is a $3.2 million decline in, in revenues to the college that's being driven by enrollment, as well as um, reduced support from the state of Idaho um, in the form of appropriations for general fund and for CTE. So that's a 7% decline in revenue, which is, uh, frankly, we will acknowledge that that's a substantial decline in revenue year over year. I would also note that part of this change includes a 2% um, base reduction from the state of Idaho going forward. And so that's also included in this, in this change. This is Trustee Banducci. Chair uh, Dunlop, may I ask a question, please? Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, Trustee Banducci. Thank you. Uh, Chris, I heard some chatter today sitting with the other three superintendents of the K-12 world locally. And you just mentioned 2%. We had looked at the 1% holdback. Is there any, are we back to the 5% from the state right now to be looking at? Did something come out like maybe today or yesterday that started talking about 5% again? Uh, actually, it came out uh, at the very end of March. We received guidance that uh, the state is asking each agency to plan for a 5% holdback um, beginning in July, um, going into the next fiscal year. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't sure on the timing, but I thought I'd heard 5% today in the discussion. So, uh, okay. Is that, is that accounted for then, I take it? I just want to jump in. It's not accounted for in the budget, and it's in addition to the 2% that's already in the budget. So that'd be a total of 7? Correct. Okay. Thank you. I just want to understand. So Thank we're simultaneously you, working on what that 5% holdback would look like um, inside of our current situation. So looking at the budget and then looking at how we would accommodate um, if there was a 5% holdback, what that, what that would entail in, in July. All right. Thank you. Absolutely. So moving on to the expense uh, forecast for next fiscal year. Um, you know, we're looking at this in multiple scenarios at the request of the board. And so just rolling in the next fiscal year without any salary or step impact, um, there's a, a reduction of 3.6% in expenses for next fiscal year. I, I do want to uh, thank all of the budget managers and, and division chairs across the campus who have worked really hard to, to produce this. And um, as we talked about in October, we were facing some headwinds before COVID-19 and we made a plan early on to start looking at how we could stabilize some of the enrollment changes that we were seeing and some of the support from the state changes that we were seeing, how we could walk into the future in a way that really set us up for success long-term. Um, that, that work the college did really early this year um, has become very, very fortuitous that we had spent that time, effort and energy looking at this so far in advance. And so, Factoring those things in, it was a 1.8% reduction in overall expenses for the college uh, going into next fiscal year. So that, that first scenario looks at if there was no step, um, we would be short $1.4 million with a, you know, excess expenses over revenue. And we'd be asking for the board to uh, authorize the use of fund balance to cover uh, any, any difference or shortfall this fiscal year due to COVID-19. The correlation between the enrollment forecast and the fund balance transfer are, are a direct correlation at this, at this moment in time. We're really uh, knowing that the, the enrollment forecast is, is a bogey that we're, we're not completely 
sure of what that number is going to come in at, um, we've modeled this using fund balance to address that shortfall. With a full 2% step, um, that would leave us, if you will, short year over year, uh, $2 million, and we would be requesting fund balance for that variance. The board also requested what would it look like if there was a half step or a partial step throughout the year. And that would be $1.7 million uh, in fund balance. So that would be what's driving uh, those changes. So there's three scenarios presented currently looking at revenue with no tuition increase and no tax increase, and then what the expenses would be with the inclusion of a step. Chair Dunlop, uh, Trustee Banducci. Okay, you bet, you bet. Go ahead, Trustee Banducci. Chris, now, as, I, as we look at these numbers, uh, I, I'm not trying to be obtuse here, but I just want to make sure I'm clear on this. Once again, and, and, and to you, uh, President McLennan, from what you had, uh, had, had spoken a moment ago, this is still, though, not inclusive of the, the potential 5% holdback that we may have to initiate come July, correct? That is, that is correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Yes, Trustee Howard. Uh, you had made a comment uh, as we started out on this particular segment of the agenda um, that we might want to consider um, maybe in the May meeting only approving um, a tuition increase. I guess I wanted to add to that comment and have maybe Chris uh, uh, remark on this. Uh, we're, we're not bound, I don't think, to have a budget that we, we can't change throughout the year. I, I, it would seem that we could approve this budget with whatever changes we want to make to it. And if in three months there are significant changes because of enrollment or other factors uh, involving the state holdback and that sort of thing, we can reopen the budget, I think, and, and, uh, and um, make adjustments according to this, the status at that time. Do I have that right? You, you not that right. That is, that is correct. Um, just moving forward, um, as we look at the overall expenses, I will just show the change year over year in, in each, each scenario here with the proposed and the expenses, noting that uh, once again, um, approximately 70% of our budget is, is personnel costs. And so that's not unusual for higher education, but that is the largest aspect of our expenses are our people. Looking at our revenue and enrollment history, uh, we bring this to the board every year. I think it's important just to share, uh, especially in looking at, at such an uncertain time, how the college has traditionally looked at all of our revenue streams. And we typically talk about a three-legged stool and working very hard to try to keep balance between those and not overburden um, either local property taxpayers or our students. And I'm very proud of, of the work that the college continues to do there in that it's, it's a equitable share with the state still carrying more than our students or our local taxpayers. We continue to talk about enrollment and especially as we go into this next fiscal year um, with some of the uncertainty, um, I would like to, to just provide support for um, Dr. Stanley and his team and the work that they're doing at this moment, specifically remotely um, working to retain students and ensure that they feel like they have a place here in the fall and that we will be here to provide services for them. Marketing and communications is also spreading that message. Um, I, I believe the message is we're here, we're close to home, we're safe, and we're affordable. And so uh, making sure that we're promoting that message as we go into the fall, we do continue to see, see some enrollment declines. I would note one of the things that, that I'm happy to see is we are seeing a leveling off of our dual credit students. And so that's helpful Chair, for us as we go into this time. Chair Dunlap, Trustee Banducci, if I may, sir. Absolutely. Chris, I'm following through on the slides inside our um, trustee booklet, and I'm also watching them on the screen. There was a slide that you showed a moment ago before the two, uh, the bar graph. And it showed the FY20 approved, the FY21 approved, the percent, the dollar difference and the percent difference. 
And then in our book, there was a next slide that showed FY20 and FY21 for uh, revenue, and it gave us total revenue numbers, and then below that showed those operating expenses again of the approximately 50 million for the FY20 and about 48.8 for the FY21. Are we going to see that slide later, or was there a reason we didn't note that slide? That, that showed the decrease in revenue of about three, almost 3.3 million in the FY21 proposed. Uh, we're looking at page five. Yes, yes, sir, of 16. Yeah, this was just a different way to show um, the revenue and the expense pieces that we just looked at. And so happy to discuss anything on here, um, but it was just a different way of looking at those side by side as opposed to just looking at revenue and expenses. I just thought that that was nice to have it side by side the, the versus the bar graph because it showed everything together with the um, revenues and the operating expenses. And I thought there was a, under the other revenue, I thought it gave us a, a little more illumination, if you will, as to what some of those, uh, what, what that meant. Absolutely. And so um, um, thank you for that. I'm happy to discuss that, that more. Um, we're not proposing dramatic changes on those other revenue pieces at this moment. Those have been pretty, pretty consistent and those are conservative estimates. Now the county tuition payments, Chris, those are the out of district tuition payments we get from the other counties, correct? That is correct. And we still don't foresee any legislative relief on that formula that hasn't been updated in forever. And we're just kind of where we are. Um, there will not be any legislative relief that impacts us in FY21 for sure. Um, and that has not been a topic that's gotten a lot of traction the last two legislative sessions. Okay, that was kind of my understanding, but thank you for confirming that. Absolutely. Uh, if we, if there's no questions there, if we go on to, um, to page eight, um, again, this is the staffing levels compared to our um, enrollment over time. Um, would just note that we've tried to create more transparency on this slide from what the board has seen in the past. I wanna thank Sarah Garcia for her work on this. We've actually gone back and updated this based off of budgeted positions as opposed to actual uh, employment um, to better represent the number of positions that, that are supported in each of these categories each budget year. Uh, Chair Dunlap, Trustee Banducci. Yep, go ahead. Chris, as we look at these staffing numbers, um, one of the things I, I saw in the extra information we were given, and it spoke to on the meet and confer budget recommendations, one of the things that was interesting is it talked about sub bullet three down towards the bottom of that page, talking about the college moving towards a model with more adjunct instructors and fewer full-time instructors. I guess I'm, I'm curious, two aspects to my question is, what's the final tally of our voluntary retirement and, and, and what did that have to be replaced and what doesn't? And to that point then, as we're gone through that process and we're gonna replace some, not replace some, and then looking at just natural attrition, what does that look like as, as the new paradigm, the new model? How many positions are we transferring to adjunct and part-time? I'm kind of curious because it was interesting. One of the things they talked about here is that they talk about how it's difficult to obtain and keep the high quality adjunct instructors and they can make more, you know, across the state line. And I would even say in industry, especially for the CT side. And they talked about the increase of the adjunct pay would help. And here we are with a tight budget. And the truth of it is I find the irony because for the last eight years I've been on the board, I'm the only guy that's really yelled and screamed and uh, to try to keep up for adjunct and part-time with the pay increases. And, 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 you know, I know Lita and others have supported me in that, um, but I, we've had not a lot of voice on that, and yet that's one of the very things that Meet and Confer came out. So as we look at this paradigm shift, I'm kind of curious to what that looks like and how many positions or, or how many people we're adding that are going to become part-time slash adjunct and what the impact of that is and where we come out of this voluntary retirement and how many positions are, I guess, eliminated, if you will, or at least no longer full-time slash tenure track. It, it seems interesting to me to know what that, what that economic impact is on us. And then maybe we need to rethink our position on adjunct and part-time faculty and, and what their pay scale is, whether they be a transfer or, or academic transfer or, or CTE. Because again, one thing to get paid a little more over community colleges, but depending on the economy, sometimes it's very hard to compete 
on the CTE side, you know, with welding or whatever, I've talked about that with the potential differential for our harder to hire vocations. So just, just some thoughts. I don't know if you have anything off the top of your head or in your notes, but I'd love to hear more information on that at some point. Chair Dunlap? Yes. Trustee Banducci, uh, just in response to that, we did have a, a highly successful early retirement um, offering. Um, and I believe our final number came out at 14 individuals who took us up on, on the early retirement buyout. Um, Dr. McLennan has, has worked with all the VPs to develop a matrix that looks at what thought process we go through to replace those positions. And that work is ongoing, but already we've, we've recovered um, more than $600,000 in salary and expense savings related to the early retirement buyout flowing into the FY21 budget. And so that work is still ongoing, but I would also offer, um, I appreciate both meet and confer and your support for our adjunct um, instructors. One thing I would note that over the last several years, because of the declining enrollment, we have not utilized adjunct instructors to the extent that we have in the past. And so part of that um, could, be, could be questioned the rationale for why we haven't pushed for adjunct increases during this time period, but part of it has been a competitive supply and demand issue, just to, to put that um, really boldly or bluntly, what's driven some of those changes with our adjunct instructor rates over the last couple of years. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chris. Um, Chris, could you also comment on, as, as I understand it from an earlier conversation, um, the, the 14 um, people that have accepted early retirement is one component of this the staff or faculty reduction, but there's also a number of positions that are not being filled. Could you comment on that or maybe um, President McClellan can talk on it? Absolutely. So as, as part of the, the work that began in October, uh, essentially the college put a, put a hold on all refilling of positions. And while we always review those positions and there's a discussion on replacing or rehiring any positions, that has definitely been more stringent over this fiscal year. And so um, there are, and I'm going to go off the top of my head on this one, but there are at least 15 of those positions that have come open throughout the year that have also gone through a process to evaluate and look at what positions are critical during this time and which positions would remain open. Our intent um, in October was to not refill five of those positions through attrition. Um, and the number of, of positions currently that are being looked at not being refilled is, is greater than the five. Um, and and I, I can pull that number for you but it's been much more successful than just holding off on five, looking at where our enrollment is, creating some greater savings through attrition than we'd originally planned. Dr. McLennan, I'll defer to you if you wanna add anything to that. I think you did a good job, Chris. Um, and if, just one other element that when we started working on this back in October, uh, it was in anticipation, response, or the idea that in front of us, looking at some of the structural uh, pieces of the of the budget um, that we were going to have to start looking at staff reductions, and so this was uh, more of a glide path into some of those staff reductions than than an abrupt one. And uh, and I we have been we did achieve greater uh, gains on that than I thought than I thought that we would or that we're planned for in the budget. But we're going to continue with that as we go into the next year. Chair Dunlop and, and trustees, if I may, just go back to a previous conversation. As we talk about the five-year, uh, excuse me, the five percent holdback, a part of the work that's being done internally is looking at which one of those positions could remain open throughout this fiscal year. So not not getting rid of the position, but not filling those positions during this fiscal year, and that is that has proved very helpful in us developing a plan for the five percent holdback going into this next fiscal year. So it was an in, intentional choice not to include that in the budget. Um, since A, we were just asked to plan for it and it isn't, it isn't an actuality yet, but also we believed we could accommodate uh, most of that 5% holdback through work that we're doing inside of, of the proposed budget. Mr. Chair? Yes, Trustee Wood. I'd like to um, refer to the meet and confer document for a moment. On bullet point number three, um, with the college moving toward a model of more adjunct instructors. I'm not aware of the college moving toward that model. 
That's certainly not something the board has advocated for. Adjunct have their place. They do a wonderful job for us. But as a former student on that campus, um, we know that our full-time employees provide the level of service that adjunct, just by the nature of them not being a full-time employee, cannot provide. And so that's a real philosophical discussion that I think would go to the, the entire board on a standalone subject if we ever decided to move toward a model of more adjunct. I'd like Dr. McLennan's comment on that, please. So there, there is no policy direction or uh, um, action on the part of the college or the administration to, to move away from a formula or any kind of a form, formula. This has just been a, um, I think, uh, uh, the relationship between enrollment and the reduced use of part-time faculty has been really because full-time faculty uh, were able to jump into those places to make to make load. So we're actually, the, the ratio is actually changing. And some of the part-time load that we are using right now is faculty uh, overload that's, um, so it looks, sometimes it looks like part-time uh, load, but it's actually being uh, fulfilled by full-time faculty. Uh, but as I, I um, welcome any discussion that would be valuable to the board to, to discuss what what that relationship would look like. Right now, it's enrollment driven, so so there's not a there's not an intentional enrollment management um, activity or, or initiative underway to say we want to get to this this percentage or that percentage with one or the other. It's truly uh, and and I maybe pull Dr. Burns into this as well. That um, frankly, as enrollments decline, there have been part of our reasons for going into the structural view of the of the budget back earlier in the fall and looking at this over a three-year period of time is that if you recall, we talked about the levers that could be pulled, one of those being enrollment, and, and there were others uh, that absent the enrollment growth, the, the, the pathway to reducing positions was going to have to continue, and that includes staff and faculty. For the faculty, it does become an issue of making load at some point if the enrollments are low enough for the number of full-time faculty that we have to fill those uh, enrollments. And, and that's why you're seeing the reduction of part-time because full-time faculty are taking those, those spots. Is that accurate, Lita, if I captured that? Rick, you have um, captured that, excuse me. Chair Dunlap, may I respond, please? Absolutely. President Dunlap, um, excuse me, President, gosh, I am really not doing well tonight. President McLennan, um, you are accurate. Uh, there was a point in time where we had, uh, it would appear to be an increasing, uh, more, a ratio of full-time faculty, part-time faculty um, was lowered. However, in recent years, particularly with the decrease in enrollment, the way we have um, managed to uh, address that decrease in enrollment is to uh, unfortunately have, have not have high of use of um, adjunct faculty as we had in the past. So right now I would tell you that our ratio to uh, full-time faculty to part-time faculty it is consistent with the way it was probably prior to 2008. If you look at the uh, bar chart that uh, Chris had put up that shows the staffing levels, uh, part-time faculty is at 91, and that's a difference of 50-some-odd uh, positions from fiscal year 13. So there has been a uh, consistent decline uh, based on enrollment uh, of the part-time faculty. So the notion that uh, we're somehow supplanting full-time faculty with uh, part-time. I'm not sure uh, washes with relation to that comment in the resolution that Trustee Wood pointed out. Chair Dunlap, when we're if we're done with this, I don't know if we are yet. This is uh, 
Trustee Banducci, I have another but different question for Chris regarding the budget, but I don't want to, I didn't yep. know if it was time to jump in or not. Yep, go ahead. Chris, one of the other supplemental documents that we received was one regarding about the FY21 benefit renewal. Uh, also looks like it came from the meet and confer. Um, interesting, uh, enlightening. Of course, you know, I'm in the insurance industry on the life and health side, so I was curious to see these. I, I do have a couple of questions, and I did appreciate the second page that broke out the, the three options for the health care, showed the vision. I, I would have also been interested to see the uh, short-term disability with the UNUM, but because uh, there was a significant increase there. And, and according to the notes, we've had uh, a significant utilization there. But one of the things I guess I want to, uh, two questions I have. One is, on the select program, even though money's a little tight, we went from the $1,000 deductible to the 750 deductible. So we actually improved the benefit a little bit, which would, would drive our rate a little bit more. Um, I guess I'm wondering, was there just not that much of a difference? Because sometimes you can get a little better deductible and really the di price difference isn't that much and it makes sense to buy down or buy up, you know, how that goes. Was it a very, was, you know, I'm looking at the numbers in the aggregate. Um, was that the decision of why we went from the thousand to 750 or did they get rid of the thousand or, cause I mean, I just, I guess it seems unusual to improve a benefit while we're, we're worrying about the money and the, and the cost is going up you know, 265,000 on the medical. Uh, so I was just curious on that. And then a, a second question would be, as I look at the budget and I'm looking at the numbers and I, I see the salary, salary portion going down a little bit from 25.95 million to 25, about 25.4. But I see the benefits actually going up uh, about 50,000 and change. Is the reason the benefits are going up while the salary is going down is because of the increase in these health care and vision and short-term disability costs? Is that what accounting for that? Uh, Chair Dunlop, Trustee Banducci, just two, two, I'll try to answer that question in two parts. Um, regarding the change in the benefits in the salary piece, part of that is how we budget for open positions. And so we may have had someone who was on a, a single health insurance plan or they weren't using our health insurance, when that position opens up uh, from a conservative standpoint, we go ahead and we budget that person at full benefits, uh, full family coverage, not knowing um, what that person's situation may be. And so that's part of what's driving that change you see on the benefit cost. The other part is just that benefits did increase this year um, a, little over, a little over 6%. And so the health insurance piece did go up. So that's question number one. Um, Question number two was about why we made the change from the, the 750 and the $1,000 plans to um, adding a $1,500 PPO plan. Part of well, that I thought is, it was good you put the HSA in there too, though. Sorry, Chris, didn't interrupt you, but I did like that you added an additional plan too. So I don't want to sound like I'm negative. I'm just understanding the, trying to understand the change. No, absolutely. Part of it was because we were adding the HSA, trying to create more variation between the offerings that we provide to our employees. The 750 and the $1,000 wasn't really that different, if you will. Um, and okay. so we were trying to really encourage our employees to say, if you need and you want to buy that, that $1,500 PPO plan to make it worthwhile because there was already a buy up on that plan compared to the, the $1,000, the 750 plan. And so it was to create more variation. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, I appreciate it. I just was curious to the rationale and, and I, so I appreciate the explanation. Thank you. Mr. Chair? Yes, Trustee Wood. Thank you. Um, Chris, this insurance document was at my request. And I, I appreciate you doing that. Um, I, my question is, you said it went up about 6%. Is that the norm you're seeing uh, across the nation? Is that um, right in the, the range that everyone else is dealing with? Or is it just our provider? Uh, Chair Dunlap? Trustee Wood, um, frankly, we were really uh, grateful and excited to see a single digit increase. Um, just to be, to be really honest about this, part of what's driving that cost and experience for us has been the investment the college has made in wellness has allowed us to really um, manage our experience ratings, if you will, on, on a really positive way. We did go out to market 
and received several very competitive offers. We stayed with Regents um, and, and how, how we vetted that, uh, knowing that it was a competitive offer is we received a, another competitor's offer that was within a few basis points of what Regents offered. And so um, we, we felt like we were priced uh, exactly where we should be and it was very competitive. What we're seeing at other colleges around the state has been larger increases if they're not on the state plan. Chair Dunlap, this is Trustee Banducci, if I may, sir. Absolutely, go ahead. Christy, to, if, if I may, uh, to Chris's point, a single digit increase is considered very good. Just, for, I, I, I do a lot of groups, uh, not, not colleges in this size, but I have some groups, big and small. So that would be, I would consider that to be a call I would be okay to make to my company to explain the renewal. And I, I think Chris shows it as 6.8%, but again, single digits right now, very acceptable. And that's a good renewal from, from my experience professionally. I, I apologize for jumping back and forth, but I want to be responsive to the questions. Um, I was going to go back to the budget presentation and just walk through a couple more things if that's the will of the board. Yeah, please do, Chris. Just wanted to highlight, I, again, I really appreciate the campus's work here and, and holding tuition flat. Um, that was a decision that we made early on this year, and, and part of that has been all of our colleagues on the four-year side um, made a commitment early on uh, in the year to hold tuition flat, and we would also propose uh, holding our students flat for tuition uh, going into this upcoming year. What's unique this year compared to past years is we have also looked at increasing all non-district students, um, regardless of their residency. Um, we've held Kootenai County flat, but we've increased our non-district students. Uh, given that we've done that the last few years, this year we're proposing just keeping all tuition flat at this moment. Mr. Chair. Trustee Howard. Uh, Chris, um, again, going back, I think a little bit to um, what we talked about in our individual sessions. Um, looking at the Washington residents, the Wooey residents, and the out of state or international, um, I'm wondering if um, it wouldn't be appropriate to go ahead and increase those tuitions. Um, and we were going to look at how many students do we actually get in? I, 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 and are we still, are we competitive with um, um, competing institutions in the area at those increased rates? My recollection from our prior discussions in the last few years are that we're very competitive and that's why we have a number of students showing up from Washington uh, to, to go to NIC. Could, could you just address that for a few minutes so we have whatever information you were able to get? put together. Chair Dunlap, Trustee Howard, um, we're still working on the actual data for that and I apologize that we didn't get that out to you before this meeting. We have we have seen increased enrollments from Washington this year over our forecast, specifically in our CTE programs, which frankly was surprising to several of us as we looked at our numbers this year. Um, we, we do remain very, very competitive and um, we're working on pulling the current rates from Spokane Community College so we can show you that comparison as well as the number of students that we have from from Washington and from WUI. Mr. Chair. Oh, go ahead. Um, one of the reasons uh, why I, I would like to see that data is I, obviously we don't want to price ourselves out of students, but there's, there probably is a point uh, some kind of a sweet spot where where we might be able to increase the tuition and yet not uh, threaten uh, enrollments from out of state. So I don't know how you can arrive at that kind of a, um, an analysis, but if you could suggest something, if indeed um, that's a possibility, that would help us, I think, help me anyway, uh, look at the potential for increasing the tuition for those um, uh, student classifications. Uh, Chair Dunlop and Trustee Howard, we can definitely do that and start working on that. We've tried to really be careful and, and as we've made these, these increases the last several years, ensure that we remain competitive and that we're still attractive to our Washington residents specifically. Uh, that's, that's been really important and we will um, put that together and get that to the board 
quickly. Chair Dunlap, if I may, Trustee Banducci. Yep, absolutely. Thank you, sir. Um, not as much a question as it is an observation, and, and I'm not trying to pick at it. It's just sometimes you look at something and you kind of go, hmm. And so, you know, what, what, do a, what are, are the appearances? We looked, we've had a lot of talking here about staffing, if you will, faculty and part-time and full-time and adjunct and, 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 you know, looking at that and someone said, you know, 99 to 91 and, we, and then we see faculties down a little bit. And we've had the, um, the voluntary retirements. One of the things that could jump out that someone might question just because is when I look, for example, on the staff and admin, I look at FY18, I had 252. I look at FY21, I've got 253. So while the other aspects of the college are, are declining, and, and probably appropriately so, our staff has was actually gone up a little in 19, up a little in 20, down a, a few positions in 21. But that's been pretty static, really, since about FY16, more so maybe than the other two components in some ways. And so I guess I just hope we're, we're taking a good look at that. I know we hired a bunch of folks. You know, we have enrollment services. We've just built a brand new building to meet and greet folks. And we're doing a lot to recruit and, and retain. And that's been a big thing, a lot, of, a lot of efforts to keep our enrollment up. So I just hope we're, we're balancing, you know, the need to, to get students there with the need of having bodies to teach them in the classroom. And, you know, I, I'm always, I guess, a little suspect or leery of, being too um, heavy on the on the middle management and the administration and 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 all the rest of that sort of stuff versus the where the rubber meets the road. I, I want lots of people on the factory floor and maybe not as many people telling them what to do. So so I don't know. That's just a little bit of an observation. But when I look at the numbers, inherently it would cause maybe someone to look at that and go, not seeing quite the same correlation uh, as we're going along. So just just a thought I throw out there, just for consideration. Mr. Uh, Trustee Wood, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to respond to Todd. That was a pretty broad brush. And I think uh, it's fine to throw it out there, Todd. But when you throw it out there, maybe ask for clarification in a future meeting, because when you get down in the weeds and you look who's assigned to what programs or, or what their actual job titles are, th there's been a justification all along. It's come to the board for those justifications. So the broad brush, if you just leave it hanging, um, a lot can be assumed. So I would just suggest that if, if you have specifics or if you want to talk about it in a future meeting, um, then we do so. Oh, and Christy, I, I don't. It, it was a broad brush. It was just, just an observation, just looking at the numbers at the 10,000 foot view. And, and they may be exactly where they need to be. I, I don't know that. So I just, you know, sometimes at first blush, when you look at something, it may or not, it may or may not be what it appears. And so that was just one of those, I'm just looking at the numbers and it's not obvious to me either way, but just, I hope, you know, we're, we're looking at everything equally and, 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 applying our resources as, as judiciously as possible. That's all. Chair Dunlop. Vice President Martin. If I may, I would just also clarify that that number includes um, many grant funded positions and the college has had great success since tw uh, 2016 in sourcing grants. And so there, there is some more nuance to that number than we present maybe in that broad brush. So we may can do a better job in the future breaking that out. But I would just note some of that is directly attributed to the college's success with grants. Vice President Martin, is there anything um, else you would like to present or have discussed? I, I'll just, if it's uh, all right with the board, just move down to the capital reserve um, as well as the overall financial picture of the college and we can move on from budget here. Um, for FY 2021, you'll just notice on the capital reserve um, we're forecasting to end the year next year at $13.7 million. What's changed in this scenario from what you've seen previously is the removal of the Meyer Health and Science expansion costs. And so at this moment in time, that's been removed. Um, so that would put all $2.6 million back into the fund next year and leave, leave the board with approximately 
uh, $13.7 million. I just got a note that my screen is not being shared. I don't know if we timed out. It, yes, it's not being shared. Okay. Try this again. It's on now. I apologize for that. Uh, the next piece that I'd just like to share the, with the board is the overall budget um, for, the, for the college. This will just wrap up um, everything in one view for next fiscal year. Currently with the general fund, you'll see what we talked about previously, the $46.7 million in revenue, the $48.8 million in expenses. We'd be requesting fund balance for that difference. Looking at the fee-based budgets, uh, these changed as well year over year, and the fee-based budgets are very much driven by enrollment. So the reduction that you see from the prior pages that talk specifically about the fee budgets, this is driven by enrollment. A similar situation is with the services. So we're proposing a $5.4 million budget for the service fund, $5.4 million in expenses, and then our grants. And so what's not reflected on the grants page is some of the new money that's coming in for COVID-19 and CARES related funding. And so as we receive that information, we'll update this, but this is very much just a year over year view of uh, copying over, if you will, what's happening with our current grants. But that would give the college an overall budget for next fiscal year of $63.4 million uh, compared to last year's budget of 64.6. I appreciate uh, everyone's questions and comments and discussion and, and thank you uh, trustees for your time this week meeting individually and uh, Chair Dunlap, I'll, I'll happy to stand for questions or, or move on for discussion. Mr. Chair. Yes, Trustee Howard. Uh, thank you, Chris, for going over that. Um, and as as you went over it, I, I didn't mark down all the uncertainties and challenges that uh, you faced um, in coming up with this budget, but it was clear with the, the threatened 5% holdback, um, the nine, I think it was a 9% student reduction, uh, the COVID-19 effect, which we don't even know. I don't even think you've got that in the budget really other than through a few items. There's a lot of uncertainties uh, and challenges in this budget. And quite honestly, um, I would like to see us uh, consider a 2% property tax increase um, for the coming year to help fill the, the hole that's there and um, also no step increases this year. Um, and those are things that we probably have to work on before we look at the budget again, but, uh, and there's still gonna be a hole, I think, um, given the numbers that we were looking at. But uh, th those are things I'd like to see the board discuss now to see what the appetite is so that you guys can go back and work on that. Mr. Chair. Trustee Wood. Um, well, I, I think we should have the numbers, and we do. They provide us the numbers of what the tax increase would look like. Um, I also, Mr. Chair, you started out the meeting with an option of just setting tuition and fees. We don't have to do our budget right now. Um, we can, and as, as Trustee Howard said, we can come back and we can amend it. I think that the, it'll um, probably bring a level of comfort across campus if we don't try to set this budget right now. And, and the reason being is because of the unknowns. If we had a little more time under our belt, we could have some good conversations about whether we could do a half a step, whether we could do the full step, um, whether we could choose to do it in the fall. Um, and, and so by going to second reading and just go ahead and go with this budget with so many unknowns, I think it's gonna cause a, a lot of unease across campus. Because once you set the budget, you just gotta hope the trustees will go back and amend it. And, and we can all tell we're blue in the face say we would be willing to do that. But I, I just like the idea of working with what we know right now. Um, we don't have to do this budget right now and uh, have the information as we go. A couple quick comments. Um, just because we have a second reading at the May meeting doesn't necessarily mean we have to approve the budget in full. But uh, we have been requested uh, that 
if we don't approve the budget in full, we at least approve tuition and fees in May so that that can be set and our students are assured of that. And uh, I think at our next meeting, we can make a decision whether to approve the full budget or to uh, delay that portion of the budget until the June or, or July meeting that would give us uh, some time to, uh, and maybe a, 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 an increased level of certainty in terms of what uh, may be happening. Now, Trustee Howard suggested that we could approve the budget in full, but we could always go back and amend it. And so, you know, we as a board will have to make a decision on which way we would like to go. But uh, the second reading doesn't necessarily require us to approve it. Trustee Ben, oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, is that you? Go ahead. Is that you, Brad? Go ahead, yeah. buddy. Yeah, if I may. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Chris and Sarah for providing uh, me and, and, and Chris to Sarah a workshop over the budget. Uh, appreciate all the conversation I've heard tonight. I do believe that as we move forward, we move forward cautiously as the times call for. But I really would like us to make sure that we focus on keeping people whole. I hate the idea of uh, having to freeze anything or do anything like that. It's too hard to get that back. Uh, I do like, uh, I, I would like to look at uh, what our valuations are this year for on property tax and if there's possibility of some type of increase, not much, but some type without increase. I, I'm all in favor of that. I, I also am in favor of a, a approving a budget at some point and going back for amendment as needed. So really no major decisions during a time like this, but enough to continue operating as needed. That's all. Chair Dunlap, yep. Trustee Banducci. You bet. Um, I'm going to kind of split the difference of some of the other trustees. Um, we are getting a bit of a bump already because of new construction, and Chris reflected that. It looked like it was a, um, several hundred thousand dollars without even having to raise taxes. Here's what I will say. Psychologically, emotionally, however you want to look at it, with everything that's gone on and, and the beating that people are taking right now, and those that are out of work, those businesses that are shut down, uh, it's going to be a while to normalize and incomes are down. We're going to be into the you know, third quarter, fourth quarter again, you know, in my other life, I'm dealing with money. That's what I've been dealing with. I've been working full time because my industries are essential. So, I mean, I'm pretty much in the middle of this with everybody and seeing it for all my clients. I will say this. I think a tax increase will go over like the proverbial lead balloon. I just think that would be a tremendous mistake, and I don't want people showing up at my house at night with torches and pitchforks. I, I just, I, I think it's a bad idea to do any sort of a tax increase beyond what we're going to get from new construction. That, that's just my thought on that. Um, I just don't think people, they don't like tax increases around here anyway. Let's just face it. And in the current circumstances, I just think it's a bad idea. Uh, the, the only consideration that I'm aware of uh, with regard to a tax increase is that there is potential legislation to do away with foregone taxes. And we have uh, other community colleges in this state who take the full 3% every single year. And so uh, with the prospect of foregone taxes no longer being an option for us, the question I think before us, or one of the questions before us is, should we uh, take that tax increase? And I understand exactly uh, what you're saying about the optics not being uh, good. Uh, I think the chart that Chris had put up showed that on a $200,000 house, the increase would be about $7. And so it, it would, it's fairly marginal because of the valuations that have changed. And, and so uh, I think the, the primary driver behind consideration of a tax increase is the potential for foregone taxes to be gone forever. Any other comments about that? 
Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, Trustee Howard. Trustee Howard, are you there? Yes, I'm sorry, didn't press my little button there. Um, one of the reasons I suggested the 2% was precisely the reason that you just gave about the fact that our stewardship in the past, and I think over the last seven years, we've raised taxes twice or something like that. Um, our stewardship in terms of putting that money into the foregone tax coffers really hasn't seemed to work out for us at all. Um, and so we might as well be judicious about doing, taking small increases when we, when we can in order to meet the budget needs. And this year is a particularly um, a critical year. Uh, when you say it, it would go over not well with the public, I, I, I believe that. But at the same time, when you look at what the state has done to us in terms of the holdbacks and the amount of money that the state has taken back from us because of the funding mechanisms and the changes, uh, what the state has done is really caused us to have to shift some of the burden from the state to the local property tax owners. That's not us doing it. It's the state doing it. So I think the 2% is a, probably a, um, a smart move for us this year, um, quite frankly. The, the, um, the idea that we um, shouldn't take a tax increase this year, I, I think um, I can understand why people would feel that way. But that's one of the reasons why I also don't think that we would give, should give a step increase because uh, um, there's a lot of people out of work. There's a lot of people that aren't making a living there. They're just hard trying to get by. And if we give a, a, a increase to our employees, although they well deserve it, in the, the context of the present environment, I don't think that that would go over well either. Mr. Chair. Trustee Wood. I, I think um, I'm looking forward to the next um, second reading because we'll have some more information, but I, um, I the tax increase uh, could be I guess really seriously discussed if we looked at our fund balance and our capital improvement fund and really to really determined that we need to take that increase. And so we'll have to spend some time on that discussion. Um, is this something we absolutely need to do? And, and same with the step increase um, between those two funds. Is this something that we could manage and, and it doesn't have to be all at once. We could look at a, a half of half of the step, with um, perhaps a, a an agreement that when we're made whole, we will uh, honor that. And I know that that always seems to get lost in discussion. But what I know about employees is they never forget it. They keep track of those uh, half a step or whatever it may be because I'm a former public employee, so I know that well. Um, but what I also know about employees, I know um, when we went through the recession, the organization I was with, we, we did everything we could to assist the city um, understand what was affordable and look for some kind of partnership to how we could make it up down the road. So I'd, I'd look forward to those kind of conversations. And um, again, before we would seriously consider a tax increase, we have to have some real conversations about our fund balance and our capital improvement fund. Mr. Chair. Yes, Trustee Howard. Um, one of the thoughts that comes to my mind as I listen to this discussion about maybe uh, pushing this decision down the road a little bit is we generally don't have a meeting in July. Um, and we do have one in June. So would is, is this going to be, are we going to be in a position in June to have enough more information and if we have to go until August, will that be too late? I mean, Chris or, or, or somebody, can you give us an idea of when you really need to know um, what you need to have a budget that you can work with? Richard Dunlop? Yes, uh, Vice President Martin, go ahead. Um, Trustee Howard, I, th I think there's two pieces to that conversation. And one of them is the board can offer a continuing resolution and we could continue to operate, uh, e even at the June meeting, the board could authorize a continuing resolution for the, the budget to go into a date into the future. Um, if that was August or September, and we could relook at, at the budget at that point in time. That, that's an option. Um, 
I would I would defer to Dr. McLennan if he would like to change that or clarify anything that I've said there. Um, can I ask a question while we're waiting for Dr. McLennan? Chris, uh, when, when do we have to have the information to the county on taxes? The, the tax piece uh, we have to have in September. President McLennan, are you still there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Uh, and I don't have anything to add to Chris's comments. Okay. Any other discussion uh, related uh, to the budget in terms of uh, options uh, in, and, or in terms of timing uh, go, looking forward to the May meeting? Hearing uh, no further discussion, uh, then I think there's a number of considerations we need to weigh uh, that include the uh, issue of a tax increase, uh, how much of a reserve we may want to utilize, and what the timing is for approval of the budget, notwithstanding the tuition and fees that need to be approved uh, in May. <coughs> Excuse me. So if there is no further discussion on that, I will move to uh, the board chair's report. And I just have a couple items that I want to mention. Uh, first of all, uh, I want on behalf of the trustees, I want to again uh, congratulate the staff, faculty, and administrators of the college for the absolutely outstanding job you did in preparation for the accreditation visit. Uh, not only uh, in articulating everything that the college does, but also in preparing the trustees to participate in that uh, uh, interview process. So thank you very much and congratulations on that. Uh, secondly, uh, the six faculty members that were, were uh, awarded tenure, I want to reiterate the fact that it is well-deserved. Congratulations. We hope you celebrate tonight. We wish you, we could celebrate with you tonight. But uh, it's a, uh, a significant event in your lives, and uh, we appreciate all you do for the college and our students. And then lastly, I want to mention that uh, comments related to the board conduct policy need to be forwarded to Trustee Howard within a couple weeks. And then we'll take a look at uh, comments and determine what the next steps are that may or may not include uh, a workshop. And so having said that, are there any uh, comments for the good of the order? Uh, Chair Dunlop, uh, Trustee Banducci. Yep, please go ahead. Just a, a thought, since we're now in the age of Zoom, um, it occurs to me that, and maybe Andy can tell us if, if there's much expense involved, but I think it would be nice to have the Zoom capability in addition, even after we're back in person. Uh, I think it'd be nice we could have the Zoom uh, option for folks in the future. I think it's tremendously convenient. Uh, it's very timely and relevant that people can see our meetings live instead of having to wait to try to catch it on TV after the fact. Maybe it's some crazy channel in Post Falls anyway. Coeur is a little easier to find. Or come to our website to try to find it. But I think having it right then, it gives more transparency. I think it, with the ease, it will encourage more participation from the community. It's easier to disseminate that out and, and let people know it's aware and they're thinking about it. And this tonight, sit in their jammies if they want, they can watch it. And so anyway, I'd like to encourage us to, to uh, investigate the fact that even after we go back to what I'll call normal operations, that we have the uh, Zoom capability or option still available for folks to be able to, uh, to uh, witness our meetings real time. I, I think that'd be a great addition uh, to reach out to the community and, and give them more access to us. Thank you, Trustee Banducci. I, I think we'll uh, rely on uh, President McLennan and his operation to determine 
uh, if that's doable and whether we're comfortable uh, moving in that direction. Any other comments for the good of the order? Hearing none, uh, we're adjourned. Thank you very much, everybody.